so we, we find ourselves in a very strange world now in 2007. Uh, a lot of the assumptions that we had about what the software industry um, is, or, or let me say perhaps more accurately was, have, have fundamentally changed. And people who thought of themselves as leaders in the software industry, maybe in terms of market, uh, with absolutely overwhelming market share, now see themselves all of a sudden threatened um, by open source, by standards, and by online technologies, um, which basically anybody would have guessed would have happened eventually. But what we're starting to see is it's happening, right? And so we're seeing technologies now like virtual world, like mashups, um, open source office applications, uh, well beyond what we did on the horizontal level with Eclipse and, and Linux, really start to take hold and fundamentally change the industries. Um, and this battle is not just being fought, let me say, at the customer level when we go into a, a bank or an energy uh, company or something like this. It's being fought in the universities. It's being fought in the legislatures around the world. Um, California, Texas, Minnesota, things in Ma Massachusetts, but around the world in the Nordics, in, in Bolivia, in Peru, in Japan, in Australia, in Singapore. Uh, they're asking some very fundamental questions. They're asking what does openness really mean? And here I, I don't mean what the marketing department says open is. I mean what it really means. And how should that change our policies? Should it change our policies? Um, and um, as I go along and we talk about some of these ideas, and I'll be talking about both open source and standards and some future directions and what all this means, what, what I want to try to do is give you a, at least my opinion of some way that you can interpret the things you hear. All right, so when you see headlines or you see this company does this or that organization does whatever, why? Why are they doing these things? Um, you know, some of them may be good things, some of them may be bad things, some of them may look like good things, but they're less good than you think they are, and so forth. So there are a lot of questions you need to ask yourself. There are people, because of this shift to open technologies, there are many opportunities that people are taking advantage of, but for many, many people, there are threats, right? Open is seen as bad by some people, right? Or bad as part to some people's business, they will respond in different ways. How do you know how they respond? Um, and what will you do, whether it's from an education perspective or as you might be involved with businesses and things like that? So to kick it off, um, <clears throat> I mentioned open source, I mentioned standards. I want to just talk about differentiating between the two of them. This term open source is misused all over the place. You see it in the popular press. You can probably find it in People magazine. Totally wrong, and trust me, they're not talking about source code. Yeah. Um, it, people have just kind of adopted this open source phrase as meaning sharing, right? I open sourced my vacation pictures because I gave them to my sister, you know. Um, and part of the problem is, is that, you know, it's really been a somewhat technical definition. Uh, now, whatever open means, you know, source refers to computer source code. And well more than 99% of the population of the planet have no idea what computer source code is. They have never seen it. Moreover, they never want to see it. <laughs> okay, right? <clears throat> and therefore, reasoning about it might not be that easy. <laughs> okay, so um, they certainly don't know what Perl is or PHP or, or, or C++ or any of these types of things. And so, since they're not aware of how computer software is constructed in the specific languages and things like libraries and algorithms and whatever, this is all a little fuzzy in a high level. And so it can border on almost the ideological discussion, as I said, about freedom and sharing and things like that, which can you know, be off-putting to some folks. But nevertheless, uh, because we are, if you will, in the post-Napster generation, uh, where people got their hands slapped one way or another about this, um, people kind of get this idea of, you know, I can put digital content of some form on my computer and I can give it to somebody else, or even better, I can get it from somebody else. So there is this changing notion of, of uh, digital content, be it you know, music or whatever, and I, I won't get into copyright and things like that, but bring it back to source code, is I have something, it might be of value to you, I'm a nice guy, I'll give it to you. Or, gosh, I just hit a problem, I'll ask you, can I have something like that? And of course that extends to the much more major projects like Linux and things like that. So when we talk about standards, to, to start this, 
and these so-called international standards, the ODF, the HTMLs, the XMLs, and all these things you may have heard of. Essentially, these are just pieces of paper. You know, we can print it out. They are specifications. They're blueprints. They said, if you were to implement something, this is the way you should do it. All right? If you're going to talk to me, you've got to follow these rules, or I won't know what you're talking about. Standards themselves are not implementation. All right? So to say something like, yeah, we support standards. We all use Windows. It's not quite the correct use of standards as I mean it here. Okay, that's a de facto standard or a usage type of thing. So when we talk about standards or open standards, we're talking about these specifications. Now you gotta do something with them, all right? At some point you have to create software. And the nice thing about open standards is you can produce proprietary software or you can produce free or open source software as well. So when we talk about open source, we're talking about real concrete code, actual computer code that sits on somebody's hard drive somewhere, maybe in a repository somewhere, it has attached a license, and people hear about, oh, there are more than 50 open source licenses and things like that. Well, great. Who cares? There are about five that are you know, well more than 90% of all usage. And there are five because they're slightly different flavors of what people are trying to accomplish with them. And even if we deleted them all, probably in a year or two, there'd be about five that everybody used. <laughs> OK, because they actually represent different ways of people thinking about sharing different types of things. And yeah, we could get into you know, ideological fights, so, or, or, or short sleeves, and things like this. So nevertheless, whether we're talking about standards or open source, there's some words that just keep coming back. Uh, this word, transparent. The notion of transparency. I can see what's being done. I can see why people are participating in this way. I know what they're saying. I can get a better sense of their motivations. I can measure them and what they say against what's of interest to me. And I can see how the group made its decisions, right? So that's good. Community, the group. This is so important, this notion. Um, you, if there's one thing that has changed, it's this development of people into these loose communities of all sorts via the internet. So maybe they're writing code. Maybe they're developing standards. Or yes, maybe they're hanging out in Second Life. Or maybe they're building buildings in Second Life. And they're inviting their friends over. And they're hanging out. And they're doing new and interesting things there as well. So I'll return to that idea and some of the things we're doing around, around Second Life and, and some of the open source issues as well. Um, so particularly transparent community involvement and some notion of free. Right? And uh, you know, so it may not be free, take it, do whatever you want. There may be a couple of strings attached, something along the lines of, OK, if you use this, you can't sue me <laughs> for my using some of your stuff in the same area type of thing. So again, there's some common practice here. So, um, so transparency, community, and free. All right? And here I mean free, free. Free as in beer. Um, <clears throat> so innovation. So I want to tie it to this. And this is one of the reasons why this is becoming so interesting. It's because new ideas are certainly entering into the world here around IT. Um, th this is an interesting topic. So it, you know, if I was a marketing person, I would give you these very nice, fluffy messages about innovation. You know, so here's the bottom line. Innovation's good. Uh, I, I mean, wh what more do you really need to know? OK? Now, OK, all right. Where does it come from? That's what you really need. Yeah. So it's good stuff. Where does it come from? How do I get more? That's the whole basis of what we, we, we really want to talk about. And, and so it gets harder, <laughs> therefore, as you think about this. So one, one easy way we have around innovation is we spend about $5.5 billion a year on R&D. Now, maybe not so easy. That's a lot of money, right? But one way of doing it is saying, I will pay you. <laughs> think great thoughts. <laughs> OK? Um, now, so it reminds me when I was in grad school, and I was in grad school for a somewhat extended period in time. And, um, <laughs> all right. Doesn't have <laughs> my, my I took five and a half years off in the middle, if you will. So, so while it looks like 12 years, it's really less than that. But in any case, there was a Thursday where my advisor said, you will be done on Monday. And so this is like innovation on demand, right? <laughs> um, and ama amazingly, I was. I don't know what, what happened, but I was done. Um, so 
so it's all about this idea of saying great new ideas. And this is what I might term more breakthrough innovation as opposed to what some people classify as continuous innovation. Lots of little things that all fit together to cause something new and wonderful. So here, I really want to kind of focus on what are the big ideas that suddenly change the way we look at things. So blogging, let's, let's take that. Um, is blogging innovative? Well, you can kind of look at uh, you know, a few key people coming together. Five years ago, not that many people blogging. Now, tens of thousands or more people blogging. Um, is it innovative? Um, well, that's kind of cool. You've got some new software. Ask people in politics or journalism about blogging. It's really, really changed. So people who are in, in computer science have been using forums and bulletin boards and things for years. Yeah, we've been chatting and things like this. We don't maybe need these blogs. But combined with RSS feeds and searches and all these types of things, and enough aggressive people standing up and actually saying something that other people will listen to, it has changed um, the journalism area. And it's changed um, in, in measurable ways certain recent elections. So that's an innovation of sorts that reaches into many different areas. So don't think of innovation purely as technical. Don't think of it as some great new algorithm or some great new format. You have to think of all the other things that, that follow on from this. So the economic aspect. Is Linux innovative? People have been fighting about this for years. You know, Certain people say, no, they just copied things from Unix or proprietary software. And they say, but you copied this from us. And yeah, you can go back and forth, and I don't really care at the technical level. But has Linux been innovative in terms of economics and the industry? Yeah. Yeah. Has it changed business models? Yeah. Has it taught people success stories? Very, very much so. So you can look at it, technical innovation, economic innovation, political innovation, academic, yes, and even legal. Uh, Paul referred to this patent pledge we did at the beginning of 2005. By the time we did a different pledge in October of 2005 around healthcare and education, our intellectual property attorneys had already changed the way they needed to express certain aspects of these statements. Because within the legal community, there had been a different understanding of what it meant if I give something to you and you give something to somebody else, what is my relationship to that other person? So, so the answer is, you, I really gave them both. <laughs> that's, the, that's the political answer. But they didn't even know that in January 2005. But they had different legal theories now being driven because of, of these sorts of things. So what we're trying to do around innovation here is disrupt the status quo in different ways to find new growth opportunities, new places to go and do something fundamentally different, either because it's growth, it's a good thing to do for the human condition, or if you're a business, it's a good thing to do to possibly make more money. Okay, and maybe help the human condition while you go along. So one example of this is this project called Sahana, which not too many people have heard about. Um, so you know, the world has had a number of, of nat uh, natural disasters over the last few years. I mean, there's Katrina, there's a tsunami, but there are many others that are in somewhat different, different scale. Um, there are commercial products that people can purchase that after these disasters, uh, you can go in and you can help solve the typical problems they have because what happens is infrastructure goes down, people get hurt, people get killed, uh, roads are washed out, you're trying to find everybody, you're trying to fix the situation, and meanwhile you've got all these people coming in from external sources, non-government organizations, let me help, let me help, here's money, here's people, here's, you know, all this type of thing, which almost makes the problem worse, right, and things like this. So the last thing a prime minister or the head of some agency you know, emergency management wants to hear is after one of these disasters is a salesman show up and say, let me give you a good price on this disaster management software, right? Um, and ethically, it doesn't go over too well either, right? So what these guys did, and it's a number of people, in fact, there, there are a couple of folks for, formerly from IBM who live in Sri Lanka uh, who were a part of this as well, saying, yeah, we can write this in open source. We know how to do this. And we can get people all over the world to come together and build some software. And so now when agencies can come in, they're not trying to sell anything. They say, where can we set up the servers? We'll install the software. We'll get it running. Let, you know, we'll help, and things like this. And so this is a very nice, straightforward, social good, <laughs> directly you know, open source community doing something that's just the right thing to do.
All right. And so I wanted to present this as something which um, we don't have to talk about philosophy or you know, sharing and freedoms and whatever else. I can't think of anything that anybody would somehow criticize this as, no, that's not. You shouldn't do that. Right? Um, so it's, it's a good endpoint as you then think of all the range of how open source and other things can, can be used, all the way up through the commercial uh, exploitation of it as well. Now, this notion of intellectual property, and intellectual property uh, means a number of things. I mean, it can mean copyrights, it can mean patents, it can mean uh, trade secrets. Um, basically, stuff I have, stuff I thought of, stuff I own, and then with various legal labels attached to it in different ways. Uh, the way people think about it, as I just illustrated, changes. All right. Um, we started this Eclipse project inside IBM. So Eclipse started as a software development environment. So when programmers sit down and actually write some code to create software, they need tools. They need to actually type in this software. They need to test it. When things go wrong, they need to quickly find out where the problem is. They need to connect this software with that software and things like this. So it's, it's, it's really like a big construction project, right? And you need the right tools. Now, we had tools. We had too many tools. Because if you go back to the, the mid-90s, IBM, if you thought of our software, it was runtime software. Here is a database. It's humming along. It's processing transactions for a huge bank someplace. But how did that stuff get in the database and you know, to use the database to do what the bank wanted? So we'd have our guys create some tools so you could write database applications. And we had other types of software, and we had our guys write some tools so you could do those. But these tools didn't work with those tools. So you'd bring this up, do something, bring it up. Bring this up, this, oh, not right. bring this up. And then you'd start up something like VI or Emacs to just try to hook it all together. That's for the computer science people. Um, and so we decided, hey, wouldn't this be clever <laughs> if, if we had a common platform that we could use to develop all our tools? It would have a common infrastructure, so the menus would always look the same, but we could extend it in different ways. We could develop database tools and web application server tools, right, and modeling tools and all these types of things in one place. Right? And we did, um, and it went through various generations here. And then we decided we would open this up and give it away. And we started the Eclipse project about five and a half years ago. Now, I'd like to tell you that this was only because we are just the nicest people here, you know, and we couldn't help ourselves. We just wanted to share the joy, okay? Well, that part's true, but it's not the only reason, okay? Um, the reason is, so, so we wanted to share it. We do, did think it was actually very good stuff, all right? But we also understood that if this was available to more people, starting with, let's say, IBM partners, that they could write tools to improve their products and how they integrate with our products, all right? Now, of course, once this took off, people were writing stuff that had nothing to do with us. <laughs> Their own little projects, right? And they could talk. And there's lots and lots of software that's written for Eclipse, which today has nothing whatsoever to do with IBM and our products and things like this. So it was a very measured type of project where we said, this is value to us, but there is no special value of keeping it private to us. In fact, there might be an advantage to opening up and sharing. And what it ended up doing was changing the market terrifically in this space. Uh, about four years ago, there were really two leaders in this space. It was Microsoft with Visual Studio and Borland. Right? Last year, Borland tried to sell their business. Right? They didn't end up doing it. They put it in a subsidiary. Because Eclipse was now, Eclipse-based software development environments were now neck and neck with Microsoft. These were the two. So in five years, this completely changed the market. There were many new companies that exist that didn't exist because they could create things to plug into Eclipse. This is the speed at which things are moving. All right? Big changes. This whole ODF thing, open document format. We're only talking two years. OK. And you get legislators in Texas introducing bills about this stuff. That's a big change in the way of thinking about open standards, right? And things like this. So the speed of standards, the speed of the effects of open source, 
is, is really quite extreme. In fact, you have to be careful. You know, things move very quickly. You, uh, you, you have to watch the speed. <laughs> you have to say, sometimes say, is this moving too fast? Right? Are we, are we pacing ourselves correctly? Um, but because it's community-based, um, you may have no control over that. Uh, one of the things we, we say is, you know, open source and open standards level the playing field. But you can also say it's really painful to get leveled, right? So help level it without getting in the way of what's coming along here. So I want you to think about a few of these ideas, and I've done them sort of in parallel here. On the top, we have some standards. On the bottom, we have some open source projects that is real software. So on the top, of course, is the web, all right? The web is the example people all know about and have absorbed, and they forget they know about this. All right. What were you doing on the web 15 years ago? What? We were installing it. We were installing it. Yeah, or nothing. <laughs> Although some people will tell you, oh, I was buying stuff on Amazon. Uh, <laughs> no, you aren't. The web is 12 or 13 years in the mainstream, right, roughly speaking. Right, 94, 95, somewhere around there. Um, someone dates it to when the White House got a, a web page, and I'm not quite sure how that's a metric, but, uh, which was 95. <laughs> So, um, so we've got these very, relatively very few standards, starting with HTML, HTTP, XML, uh, for the web. And lo and behold, we have a handful of browsers, some of which, like Firefox, are open source. And you can access hundreds of millions of websites. Not with perfect fidelity, OK? But not bad. Well, more, again, than 90%. All right? And when you go to these websites, again, for the most part, you're not thinking, oh, you know, I got to do something special because this site runs particular software. I'll let you think about what the exception is today, okay? Um, <laughs> I'm being recorded. Um, so um, it works. It magically works. We've got these black boxes, and websites are black boxes to you, or in my case, dead boxes, evidently, <laughs> today. Um, and you just get the information, and you interact with them. Totally standards-based. You have no idea what software it could be running. They could be mainframes. They could be tiny little PCs. They could be running Sun, Oracle. You don't know, and you don't care. What do you care about? You care about how you talk to the thing, right, that it does the transaction, whatever it be, and the transaction could be as simple as requesting a web page or something much more elaborate. And you want it to be secure, and you want it to be fast enough, and you want it to be reliable talking my ISV here. Um, and uh, that's it. So you need standards, right, to do the communication, and you care about quality of service. You don't care how it's implemented. You really don't, as long as you get those things. Now, if you're in charge of running a website, you care. OK, to be clear. You care about how you actually do the implementation. So uh, further standards as we got into the web services area that reinvigorated this notion of service-oriented architecture. We had SOAP, WSDL, WS Security and then open document format for, for Office documents. And so what you were installing probably was Apache right, way back then. Um, Linux, of course. Um, MySQL for, for relatively low-end database applications, although we might have a 1,000 of them all running and doing some big stuff. Um, open Office has had quite an impact with Sun. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a, so open office is Sun's thing, just to be clear. I'm going to say some nice things about it, but it's not our baby that I'm, I'm telling you about. Um, so I have a daughter who's almost 17. Um, her computer crashed uh, last summer, which it seems to like to do every summer. New hard drive. I installed her operating system. Um, and I was rushed, and I never put her office suite back on. So end of August, school's going to start. She says, I need a word processor, and I said, do you want me to put back on what you had? Fill in the blanks. Um, <laughs> and she said, no, I want to use OpenOffice. And I said, go to openoffice.org. And that was the last I heard about it. And so at that point, she downloaded it. She installed it. She's asked me zero questions since last August. And she's just, as a junior in high school, 16-year-old, just been doing it. End of story, you know, for her. And that's what her generation is probably going to be using, right? Or enough of them to start making some changes. And you see it elsewhere. I talked to, um, 
I talked to government people. I, I was speaking to somebody who very carefully explained to me he had nearly 3,000 servers in his agency, and he knew exactly what software they were going to be running, and he knew exactly when they would be updating, all these types of things. And he said, but you know, at home I use open office. So what that represents is a shift between saying, in my professional life, this is what I have to do. But when it's me making technical decisions with my money, that's what I'm doing. And at some point, those are going to collide and are colliding. And that's why you're seeing these very interesting types of things happen. And then expand this to other types of open source software as well. Okay. And we talked about, about Firefox a little bit there. Okay, so why do we consider it's important? Um, yes, major source of innovation, which is still good. Um, you know, whoever. It doesn't, these people don't have to be paid by IBM to produce something that we could use, and by the same token, we might produce something which you can use. That's what it all boils down to. Um, which isn't to say we won't still develop some proprietary stuff. We're in this middle ground, okay? Not everything we do is open source. It isn't, okay? but an increasing amount is, all right? And we have reasons in different areas to do it, but the use is increasing, all right? So it's all about what type of open source, where is it being used, right? And when should it be used? So it's all a timing, timing question. Some case, um, it doesn't make sense because it doesn't do what we need to do right now. Um, other times we know it will make a lot of sense six months from now. And we're probably doing something about that that I'm not going to tell you about right now. All right? So that is, it's kind of an ongoing type of thing. It's a very good approach for developing emerging standards. For those of you who do remember the web wars of the 90s and the blinking text and the competing HTMLs and things like this, right? Um, we eventually settled down to, for example, XML, where it was said it either supports it or it doesn't. If it's wrong, it's wrong, we're rejecting it, as opposed to this HTML mess, which we're still living with, with where browsers sort of try to figure out what you mean. Somebody told me, um, a Microsoft guy back in the 90s, said that more than 50% of Internet Explorer at the time was trying to guess what people really meant, given the crummy HTML they got, okay, because HTML was this guess. Well, when we got to the point of using XML for exchanging you know, business transactions, I'm not going to guess whether you meant a million or a billion, you know, and things like that. So the shift going from pretty documents on the screen to web and web services for use in business, you had to tighten up quite a bit. And so therefore, we had to get rid of this idea of arbitrary vendor extensions as well. All right? So if you have a standard, and if you have a high quality implementation of it that happens to be open source, one, well, it's a reference implementation, which says this is the way the standard should work. Not how you interpret it, Mr. or Ms. Vendor. This is how it should work. But it also means there's code. So if you run a hospital, right, and you want to use web services, please don't write a SOAP processor, right? Borrow one. Take an open source one so that in a couple of hours, you're doing healthcare stuff and not writing XML you know, type stuff as well. So it speeds up the adoption of standards. And we saw that with web services. That's a totally great example about use of open source to rapidly create new technology that, that's widely used. And then as a notion of competition um, in marketplaces. Um, I, I personally find market categories that are so dominated by one vendor, and this could be any market, market category, really boring, all right? Because there are lots of important things that can be done by software. And if no innovation is happening, that's a shame. I mean, it just really comes down to it because there's, there's always something more you can do, right? There are new ideas. Um, and so with Firefox, for example, uh, with the browser, it's now somewhere around 13% or more that's enough to be significant. That's enough to cause the other guy to make changes, right? Because of either standards compliance or better user interface, right? Or what it still has as a great advantage is an extendable architecture. So again, even though the core Firefox team may not be thousands of people working on this open source project, 
it allows communities to build really cool extensions to do all sorts of nice things, right? So it gives you this freedom, permission, right, to extend it, and it's a very nice tool that you can do. And if you choose to share it, you can do that as well. So it shakes things up and allows people to bring, you know, to bring new ideas into the market. Um, and in some cases, it's the only growing competitor um, to vendors. Now I'm going to make some predictions in, in this area a little bit later about what's happening here. So how do we use open source software? Um, well, you know, all these servers, we got lots of Linux. <laughs> Hundreds of Linux servers running on IBM hardware. I recommend that combination. It's, it works well. <laughs> a message from our sponsor. Um, in hardware, you know, a lot of people might see, you know, you walk by a computer room or something, you see a big printer. Um, there's a lot of software in that printer. I mean, heck, your car, right? Something like 80% of all uh, service engagement, so that as you bring your car to the shop, roughly 80% of those are because they're electronic problems. Okay, cars are software, right, in silicon, and uh, yeah, some rubber and, and things like this. Um, but therefore, when we create hardware, there might be open source in the software that runs it. But what's sometimes the more interesting or sticky case is there is hardware that we ourselves don't manufacture, but we'll put the IBM logo on, right? So we will OEM it, right, this is, is the term. It may have open source software in there. We have to know which open source software, because our name's on there. And they're intellectual property issues, and we have to make sure that no one stole the code from somebody else and things like this. So you do have to pay attention. So in the same way that you and I, even if you had proprietary software in there, I'd probably want a certificate of originality that said that you didn't steal the software. The same sort of lesson applies as well for open source. So it's in hardware. Um, we, you don't have to have software that's 100% unto itself open source, but can contain big chunks of open source. So our WebSphere application server, the XML stuff, for example, is open source. It's from Apache. It's a project we started in the 90s. So there's this little island of open source in the middle of it for processing XML. The bigger thing is proprietary. You know, more of it is being pushed out over time in different ways. Um, so it can be in, in the middle of that. Collaboration, I have code, I have an algorithm, I'll give it to you. You make it better, you bring it back, and so forth. Different ways of going back and forth. Um, are you shocked that IBM might want to influence the direction of the IT industry? I think you'd be more shocked if we said we didn't care, right? So, I mean, that's just sort of a practical statement. You know, we're, we're, we're a big guy. We try to be, you know, transparent and fairly clear. I mean, it's why I'm here, right, in some sense, telling you what we're doing and why. Um, but we have a lot of, let's say, computer scientists who work for us. They have very definite ideas about how to do things. They're not just sitting around waiting for other people to do things and say, that's what we'll, and we'll say, okay, sure. You know, um, and so open source is a way of writing software and sharing it with people, and they're making it better, but establishing a strong direction of how things should, could be done in the computer industry. Um, as a competitive tool, yeah, of course, everything is a competitive tool in, in, in business. Uh, we talked about leveling the playing field, and then again, just you know, to, to shake up markets. But here, looking at a, a more of an economic view of saying, historically, there may be parts in the market that we, we just lost for whatever reason. Maybe we had inferior products at the time. Maybe we didn't care. Maybe we just fundamentally did not care about the market at that point. Well, what might happen now with open source is that it's opening up again because people are realizing there are different ways of doing things. Software as a service, service-oriented architecture. And this might be an opportunity for us to step in and say, we got something for you. We can play. We can help here. So this is the continuing rolling of the industry as it, as it you know, comes apart, comes back together in a different configuration, refactors itself and things like this. This is part of the effect. And there may be still things, and of course there are areas of the market we don't care all that much about. Um, so from a commercial perspective, a lot of the open source discussions get down to business models. If I'm giving it away, how am I going to make money? Well, you know, um, Verizon doesn't get asked that question when they give you a free cell phone when you start up service, right? Why? Because you're paying for all these text messages and the monthly charges and things like that. It's really pretty clear. 
that there's something after the initiation of the service that you do get something for free at the time, that you're paying for something that's ongoing. And so the software industry, this could be a subscription, it could be maintenance, it could be service, it could be building higher level things with these as building blocks and so forth. It's not written in stone that thou shalt charge money for software. You can. Okay, it's one of the business models, but it's not required. And in fact, the software industry isn't so old. I mean, 200 years ago, nobody was charging money for software. Now, let's try to move that date in. Okay, and in fact, you would find that date probably comes into the 60s to 70s. You know, it's, it's later than people think when people really start charging for software and the growth of the individual software market, PCs and, and things like that. So anything can go. Nothing has to be any one way. All right, there are no, no, as I said, stone tablets about this. So you can do lots of things. As I said, consulting integration. You can license in different ways. Um, the last point, patronage. You know, I, I mentioned, you know, I, a Linux on IBM hardware. So we are not a Linux distributor. We do have a lot of software engineers. We have about 1,000 software engineers who spend full time working on open source. Everything they create goes out the door, 1,000, many of whom are in Raleigh. All right. Um, <laughs> We don't distribute Linux. Why do we care? Well, we do care if you buy that IBM box with Linux, right? Or the IBM mainframe, which is a very nice environment, by the way. There's a lot. No, I'm, I'm saying it's surprising to a lot of people because they tend to think of, here's Linux on my PC-like box, right? But the beauty of Linux is it runs on many, many different hardware platforms, from you know, watches and, and phones and things like this all the way up to mainframes. And when you're on mainframes, you can do things that you can't do in a watch, OK? Um, like run 100 different Linux at the same time and things like this. So a lot of this virtualization stuff you may be hearing about, right, um, is, is coming back again of, of things that have been revisited for a long time. So therefore, my point is, is that you may help open source here, even though there's no direct revenue here. But there may be revenue here because of that. And the revenue may be displaced in time as well. It could be six months later, a year later. So as you think about investments, right, we have to play this game. We invest here. Where does it come from? Now, there are a lot of traditional people who say, I invest, I invest here, and I get my revenue there. <laughs> okay? And it's real hard for them to get this open source idea. If I say, but you'll get 10 times the revenue there. I say, no, 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 the quarter ends Tuesday. OK. <laughs> you know, but these are the types of attitudes. You know. um, I, I wrote a blog entry, if, you can, if my blog ever comes up again, um, which was about the five stages of grief of adopting to open source. OK. And kind of takes people through these ideas of, of saying, you know, it, it, it's different. It's, I'm uncomfortable with it. It's not who I see myself as, right? How do you adjust? Well, you can either adjust yourself, or sometimes, you know, if you look at a business, there are people who just aren't in the right jobs because of it, if, if it moves that way. That's a very general statement. Now, in terms of, of um, getting back to standards a little bit and formats, if you think about the early 80s, so I got one of these high powered IBM PCs around 1982 with 256K and a five megabyte hard drive. And I spent about $3,000, which I paid for over several years. Um, and when I got this software, there wasn't a lot of choice of word processors and things. There was something called Multimate. Some of you might remember that. Um, but it wasn't networked. There's no notion of net. I mean, network was I take the floppy out, right? We had something called floppy net. Do you ever remember floppy net? Sneaker net, yeah, right. You sort of pull it out and you run down the hall. And you get great data transfer rates, OK? <laughs> Um, as long as you don't drop it or step on it and things like that. Um, but the general idea was that, you know, the way of thinking was you create something on your computer and it's for you. And there was almost a one-to-one -one correspondence between the application and the data. Right? And so this notion of saying, well, I have another application, you know, like that situation, why don't I write my data in such a format that anybody could read it? You know, and the attitude was really either, well, yeah, okay, you want to understand the format, I'll tell you how I did it, or, you know, heck no. <laughs> it's my proprietary advantage of knowing the format and you're not knowing it, okay? 
So this idea here of saying, well, you know, applications you know, should access the data. Because whose data is it? Right? Now this came up in Massachusetts in 2005 around this notion of document formats. <laughs> Um, because they'd had some dealings with Microsoft and, and they had almost signed an agreement or maybe did sign an agreement that gave them perpetual, so forever, royalty free, right, free, right, um, license to their formats, but the fine print prevented GPL, that is free software implementation. Okay, so here's a free license but you can't use GPL software. Now, that may seem like silly now, but it just seemed normal. Well, yeah, then it's a license. You know, we sign licenses all the time. But by that summer of 2005, by August of 2005, we had Eric Chris, who was one of the top administrators in Massachusetts, saying, it comes down to a question of the sovereignty of our Commonwealth's information. And here I'll paraphrase him. I was paraphrasing my was Saying, we will not be beholden to any particular vendor to tell us what software we can and cannot use to access our information now or in the future. It's like, yeah, so? <laughs> Isn't that obvious? It wasn't. It wasn't. And people are actually in the position today, okay, of having licenses apply to the information that you yourselves have created, that you in fact don't have complete freedom to do anything you want with any software. And of course, from a government, it's an issue of not having a single supplier and having choice in the market, but it's also a question of history because these documents that people are creating today, kind of in an operational way, are the basis for the history 20, 50, 100 years from now. And software, whatever it is, will look very different then. And the names we know and love may or may not still be there, okay, and things like this. And so this notion of freedom you know, and this idea which might seem, you know, sovereignty, wow, that's some you know, real government type of philosophy sort of thing, economics, you know, and I bring you right back, this is not utopian. It's the web. You know, it's the same old thing. Hundreds of millions of web pages, right, with browsers, driven by standards. We can do this. So you couple this notion of your data formats and your open protocols and open APIs, all right, with some notion of what is a client, right? That is, what, what am I using directly? And what, am I, what are my servers? That is, what is out there in the cloud somewhere handling this type of thing? You, I guess you don't couple because there are three of them. So there are three things you do. Um, but then you start repeating this notion again. And so this is why this comes back when people are interested in document formats, okay? And this is why when people are looking at things like virtual worlds, it's the same idea, all right? I have a client that's running on my PC or Mac or whatever, Linux. I have servers that are out there that are handling the magic. And this information flowing back and forth. We just keep doing this thousands of times over and over again. So it's beholden upon us is to repeat the good lessons from the development of the web and why openness worked and repeat that in other places. And if that screws up other people's business, they will deal with it. Okay? And they will fight it which is reasonable, because if it was your business, you'd probably fight it too, okay? But for most of these things, it's not will it happen, it's when will it happen, all right? So a lot of the things we're doing, they just affect the timing. Speeds up, slows down, you know, you see little advances here, you get little, you know, things cut back over there. You say, well, gee, this is terrible today, but five months from now, this could be really good, <laughs> and things like this. So. Factor in time, very importantly, as you think about these open technologies. People forget that. They worry about tomorrow. They worry about the quarter ending on Tuesday. All right? The game is played over a much longer period of time. All right? Now, we've talked about some of these things, about the effect of open standards. All right? So it drives interoperability. And here I'm using a very democratic notion of interoperability. I'm talking about anything talking to anything. I'm not talking my software. You know, that, you know, helping you talk to my software. I tend to refer to that as intraoperability, right? That is a closed environment where I'm saying I'm doing these wonderful things, but all I'm really doing is encouraging you to help people buy more of my stuff, all right? Uh, and that's, we had to break through that with Eclipse, and we did. 
Um, it's changing this notion about proprietary methods. You know, hey, Joe, we'll make a deal. I'll talk to you if you can talk to me and things like this. You know, no one else will be able to play. Um, users are saying, wait a minute. I don't think so. I might not want to buy software from either one of you. Okay, as an advantage. Um, people can innovate on top of the web. We don't keep reinventing the web standards. They evolve, but we don't fundamentally keep, keep reinventing them. We build new businesses. We build new technologies on top of these things. Um, so we get increased competition. You know, sometimes when I talk to uh, particularly government people about um, standards, something like ODF, I will say, okay, so what this means is you will have a choice of applications. That's your choice. You don't want a choice of standards. You want a choice of applications. All right? Um, there's more competition in the marketplace. So therefore, <coughs> the competitors will be fighting against each other to have better more stable products with better features. And by the way, since there's competition, again, they'll be at lower prices. So you get choice of application, right? You get better products at a better price. What more would you like? I mean, that's the bottom line, just like innovation is good. That's what standards can do to you, OK? Now, if you don't want there to be a choice of applications, this sounds like a terrible idea if it's your application. I'm speaking very broadly here, OK? Because some of those applications that are being uh, you know, under threat here because of this might be cash cows. Most businesses have, um, let me say, most successful businesses have products that are successful, that generate a lot of revenue. And that revenue pays for the products that aren't so popular, OK? I mean, think of the music industry, right? For every big person that, that breaks through and makes a lot of money, there are lots of bands that do nothing, right? And stop the paper. Same thing in the software industry as well. So therefore, if standards and this, this increase of awareness around openness somehow threatens one of your cash cow products, you're going to fight. And you're going to fight really hard, because that's funding the rest of your business, all right? And then a question of, are you, you, are you equipped? Companies have cultures. Companies have organization. Companies have individuals who make decisions, who maybe were great in a particular configuration of the market. And if the market goes more open, this might not be the right people. It might not be the right organization. And it might not be the right culture. Okay. Um, and so um, it's a threat. And you will see responses based on all, all these types of things. Um, you know, this all boils down to individual people, right? Birds, something? OK. So features driving the, these shifts to open. Um, people are willing to see different things. You know, a lot of these big applications that have been stable market categories for years, it's very hard to come up with new things for them to do. You can tweak them forever. You can make the buttons bigger. You know, you can change the colors, you can do things like that. There's only so much you can do. And so therefore, the idea of opening this up and letting a fresh collection of minds maybe do something interesting is, is, is attractive to people. Um, this, uh, the third bullet, the shift to online applications. There's a, a term that's called Office 2.0. And it's used very uh, generally to say, yes, online word processors, that as you're sitting in a browser, and you're using technologies like Ajax and things like this. You're doing word processing or spreadsheets um, or, I guess, soon presentations, but also email and calendaring and, and everything else. Salesforce.com is customer relationship management. So you just go in with the browser saying, I don't have to install this on a big computer here. I can just access it on the web. Now, you've got a problem if the web is down, right? But you know, if you drop your laptop, you've got a problem, too. You just shift the problems, all right? Um, consumer comfort, I mentioned my daughter. Um, you know, increasingly, particularly folks in the, in the younger aspect, are, you know, the post-Napster folks, um, are very comfortable with a lot of these ideas. You know, it just doesn't seem foreign from them. They don't necessarily say, but that's just the way the business is. <laughs> right? They don't say that. And so therefore, they don't have to have those assumptions. All right? um, and driven by more things like the social networking software, instant messaging and, and yes, the MySpaces and the uh, second lives and, and the technologies and things like this. 
Um, the mashup idea of saying, well, I've got these little types of things, be them maps or anything else, typically provided by a Google or a Yahoo or something else, who I think have been actually fairly generous in, you know, for whatever reason, they, they look pretty generous, um, at letting people access these services and then combine them with other people, uh, with other services from people. Um, and so there's been a lot of creativity ar around these issues. Um, so I mentioned service-oriented architecture. Um, in brief, what this means is, uh, whereas we might have originally had some big monolithic piece of software that was all running in your data center, we say, yeah, I don't really like that architecture. It's hard to maintain these. So let's just kind of take the pieces and stretch them apart, all right? And say, you know, we don't really do this part very well. That's not our business. But there's a guy down the street or in Texas or in California that does this really well. And so I would save money and actually be a better business or a better organization if I outsource that to that other guy down the street or Texas or California, whatever. So I kind of stretch it out and I treat them as a service. So again, I worry about uh, the interaction with them. I worry about the quality of service, things like this. And then I start looking at the same type of thing. And I start worrying about saying, well, I'm in the retail industry. And you know, the week before Christmas, let's say, I need a lot more capacity, right? I need to deal with a lot more credit card authorizations. So therefore, I'm going to invoke maybe multiple services, but I want to talk to them all in the same way. So we stretch out into services the different things that our fundamental application, or in, indeed, our business does through its business processes. And as you stretch out, you're talking to the different services. You need standards, again, for the communication. Right? And you need the quality of service constraints, service level agreements, and so forth on the services. You don't care how the services are implemented. They might be open source. They might not. Right? And as I said before, the people who implement the services do care. So Google has something like an excess of 150,000 servers running Linux. You're not saying, oh, here I'm doing a search running on Linux. I'm so cool. You know, and things like, you say, you know, give me the answer fast and have them ranked well so that probably the, within the first two or three, it's what I really want. That's the value. So it makes sense to Google to have Linux in its business model, but you don't care, right? So it allows flexibility. Now, they may also be running proprietary software because for some particular part, that is exactly what they need. And in fact, many companies that do this do exactly that. A little open, a little proprietary, and the mix changes over time, going back and forth between the two of them. Okay, sometimes what happens is you develop a piece of software in a small department, use open source technologies. When it comes to go into production, you maybe use proprietary software because of whatever, maybe maintenance agreements, maybe better security or whatever. If you made that same decision two years from now, um, maybe you wouldn't have to, actually, because maybe the open source software had caught up. Right, and things like this. So it's, it's, it's very fluid here, all right? And so, so do what makes sense at what you want to pay or what you, want, what you need to pay. All right, so as you think about moving to open source, um, you know, from a practical perspective, as, as let's say a business or organization, um, these th three things, open source, SOA, and open standards are all related. They're all fueling each other. Right, open source is becoming more popular uh, because of SOA. SOA is possible because of standards. And because we have the standards, we can do SOA. You know, all these things are related. So you need any strategy you do or architecture needs to take into account all of them. Um, sometimes um, I hear this very frustrating phrase from people that say, well, we'll do whatever the market decides. Now, who's the market? You know, why do they get to decide? And the answer is, you're the market. Okay, and the ch choices you make, you're the market. You know, those of you all here today, but the larger scheme of things as well. And as you make choices about what software you will use, right, or what services you will use, or what you demand of your vendors, you will do that. Everybody plays. It is a democracy in that case. All right, open source is not going away. It's not a fad. Okay, <laughs> it's not just these crazy, you know, long-haired liberal guys, right? I know. 
I'll show you my high school picture. <laughs> I know, as I was saying that. Well, yeah, OK. I, I got photos I'll sell you myself. So. Um, but um, you know, it's just there. It's in, it's in the fabric, as, as we say. Um, Linux in the data center, it's just obvious. I, I mean, it just works. There are no questions. I mean, go visit Red Hat if you want somebody local, for example. Um, if you are a business, you should seriously get a cross-business unit group to look at open source and opportunities and management. We do that as well. Um, now, if you are a software provider, if you work for a software company, right, people are learning about open source. People are, are aware of this notion that they could possibly get so, uh, the source code. What happens if the, the entire world, 10 years from now, every customer demands having the source code? for every product they will use. It could happen. It could very much happen, all right? And not just sharing the source. Wink. Um, right? Honest to goodness, open source. That could really happen. What are you going to do as a business? What are you going to do between now and 2017 for your business? And you better not start thinking in 2016, OK? And what happens if it's five years? That's somewhat less likely. OK. But also a question of scale, things like this. So um, be prepared, at least you know, in terms of, of, of theory and understanding the strategy, to watch the market, how this moves. So let's talk a little bit about this second life thing. Um, so it's a lot of fun, of and by itself. Okay, um, There's a bit of a learning curve for the first few hours. Um, but then as you get into it, it's more fun. And particularly as you start, let me say, having land in some way, shape, or form. All right? Because beyond that, you're kind of wandering around chatting, you know, buying clothes. Um, this is a picture from, I guess, probably about six weeks ago. I'm, I'm the really handsome tall guy in the tie in the middle. Um, so I didn't wear a tie today, so I had to wear a tie there. Um, that's the IBM office. So this is on IBM-owned land, and we have 12 islands plus a number of more scattered around. Um, I think this was the first uh, bit of the land and office building that anyone had actually asked for for internal use only. So if you're not in IBM, if you don't work for IBM, you cannot come visit this building. It's access control. Now that said, I don't leave confidential stuff lying around. Right? We have rules, and we've established our own policy, working policy. We don't talk confidential stuff in, in chat and things, things like this. Um, but nevertheless, it's a useful place for my widely distributed team to just kind of hang out. All right? um, it does not replace really being in the same office building and interacting in that way. But we are never going to be in the same office building. All right, so when I did this, what do we have? So this woman was in Connecticut. She was in New York. I was in upstate New York. And she was someplace else in Connecticut. Because uh, so, so we, we really live on something called same-time instant messaging in IBM. It's the way we communicate because we're, we're so distributed. Right? So, so I'm, you know, I, I'm, if you will, the boss. Right? Let me just fix that in your mind because of the, the exalted position here. But this is what, what happens. So I will get on in the morning, and I will say, pick someone in my group. And I'll say, you know, good morning. And they'll come back and say, good morning. And then I'll be counting, you know, 1,000, 1,000, 2. And they'll say, is there anything you wanted? <laughs> you know, whereas if you know, I was in the same office, right? I'd walk down and say, you know, good morning, and just keep going, and, and that was it. So it would be casual, and it would be more comfortable, and things like this. So when you've got distributed employees, you, you try in different ways to overcome the distance and try to get better interactions in some ways. And so while there are some issues here about this, they now have voice over IP, but I still won't use that for confidential business discussions and things like this. Um, it seems to be enough of a fundamentally different animal. It's not in person. It's not I am. It's something somewhere in between yet different enough. So what I would say is interacted with people in a, a, a broader variety of ways, people with whom I work, than I did before. All right? um, we haven't worked out all the bugs about really making good use of this office building, um, although I have, this is, uh, this is the, which is this? this? This is probably my, that's my office. I have a lovely office because I got the building. So it's a lovely office. 
If I, tur if I turned it, Paul, you'd see Bob Dylan on the wall. Okay. And my wife and daughter as well. Um, but on the first floor, there are staff desks. And gosh, if certain people aren't sitting next to each other, you know, because I wanted them to hang out together, even though they're avoiding each other. <laughs> So you can play games like this, right? And so that's just, let me say, social working thing is kind of an introduction to why IBM might care internally. And so I'm conducting a, a, something with this. Now, more professionally, if you will, and externally, this is a service-oriented architecture hub. You could go and visit this. Anybody could go and visit this on IBM land. Uh, you could walk through. There are some freebie things you can pick up. There are some big displays talking about service-oriented architecture. Uh, we have people who are standing there who can answer questions about it. There are some conference rooms up above and so forth and things like that. Um, another area is, um, is retail. Does retail make sense in virtual worlds? Well, you know, think of everything that people were saying when the web was getting born. No one would ever buy anything on the web. <laughs> There's no, nothing to that. You know, if you can't go to a store, why would you buy anything? I would never trust my credit card on the web. So why not this? What does that mean? Okay, what does it mean to walk through a virtual store with virtual salespeople, right? And engage with them. Now we have to fix the connections, right? But you can go into Circuit City, which is the one on the right here, and you can see clips of movies. And so the idea is to say, I want that movie, right? And today that might mean I somehow connect to an account Right? And maybe the movie gets sent to me. But maybe this means that the movie, as I click here, the movie gets downloaded to my DVR hard drive in the other room. Because they've made a deal with Time Warner somehow. But to me, I'm just wandering into Circuit City and maybe impulsively or not making a buying decision. You know what? Any combination could happen. The technology's not all there, but it's, getting, it's improving all the time. So we don't ignore it. Okay. And um, here you see, I'm at Sears. There's me. I'm tall, I'm buff, and I seem to be at least 15 years younger. I don't know. Um, I have this blog entry, which is called Messing With Your Mind, um, which is when you're in it for a long time and you're not careful, you confuse what you can do in real life and what you can do in second life in a virtual way. Um, and uh, you, you, you get this straight after a while. OK. Um, but one, one of uh, my IBM colleagues asked me early on, he said, are you dreaming about Second Life yet? And I was like, nope. ridiculous, no. What a stupid question. I didn't say that, but you know, I'm thinking, what a stupid question. And you know, damn it, if it wasn't like the next night. Because you get, you know, what are dreams, right? I mean, dreams are somehow whatever they are, but it's the same type of thing of experiences and things like this. So you do get yourself sort of sorted out. Um, but you do identify in different ways. And as I said, as we think of it being more productive with, um, with business people, right? if we can meet with customers. So my feeling from a business use of this is if somehow you know, my group operating as a team is 5% more effective, that's great. Or another metric I have, if I can take one less business trip, and I travel a lot, you know, probably half to two thirds of the time, you know, somewhere every week. If I can take one less business trip because of Second Life, that's a win for 2007 for me. Okay, um, if only to learn learn how to do this. So um, the way reason why it relates to this topic is January 8th they announced that they were open sourcing the client. So the client is the bit that sits on your PC or your Mac or your Linux box. Okay, the server is what's back. Um, they will make their money from providing the service. Right, the inventory, um, the monthly subscription fees, the land fees, and so forth, which add up. Be careful. Um, yeah, once you get a little land, you want a little more land, and, you, and that lot next door looks very good all of a sudden. You know, things like this. So suddenly now you have this client. You can engage in a virtual world, and you've got other people who are improving the user experience. People who know how to do this. <laughs> Right? Because Linden, while they want to have a good client, they would love it for someone else to primarily drive the really big improvements. So let's say we start using Eclipse. We tie in Eclipse. 
with the building aspect and source code control and things like this and tie in more smoothly into the environment. Accessibility, what does this mean? So there are examples of people in Second Life who have various disabilities, either physical or, or, or sometimes they're mental disabilities. Um, you know, you can fly in Second Life, right? And it changes the way people can be productive in different ways. If it means that somehow it allows, uh, you know, people to, to be more productive in their own personal lives or their professional lives, do it. So it allows researchers and accessibility to play with new input methods, right, and things like this. Different things for different people. Oh, part of the reason with the statistics, so this is a little old here, um, and I wish I had the date, um, because it was very impressive at the time. But uh, it said U.S. dollars spent in the last 24 hours, $1,328,671. That's one day, okay? Um, they had their own notion of current currency, uh, Lindens and things like that. They're now up over 4 million total residents, not all of whom are on. Uh, in November, they were typically running probably about 16 or 17,000 people on at the same time. Now they're typically running 34, 35,000. They want to scale. They're trying to fight through this scalability wall right now, um, and, and it's a problem. You know, they've got, they've got to change some fundamental uh, technology here. Um, and there'll be others, by the way. One of the things I've been doing in my blog is cataloging other people who are jumping into this market. There have been historical other folks who have done open source uh, virtual reality projects. That good stuff will now enter into this, and they'll be completely different people. Uh, Sony just announced for PlayStation 3, something called PlayStation Home, which will be a virtual world available in August, as an example. Um, lots of examples. H&R Block was announced yesterday or opening up an area to help you with your taxes in Second Life. All right, the Australian uh, telco Telstra is buying an island. A French minister whose opponents all have television stations and newspapers and things like that has opened up an island. Um, it's overhyped. It is. But there's something there. Okay? Just like the web. Right? Just like the web. Okay, so the client will be open source, better user interface, things like this. The server will go next. Now, what's going to happen when the back end servers go open source? All right? So, right now, you talk to one cluster of machines, and those are the back end servers. So, the first thing that's going to happen is I'm going to get one in my home office. Okay? So, I can stop paying all these fees to Linden. Okay? To Linden Labs. But what this really means is once it goes open source, whereas we think of this grid or planet that is Second Life now, we'll start replicating. Because other people will pick up the code at some point and install it. It's open source. Remember, this is what happens with open source. Yeah. Or not, because maybe they're just so wonderful and they provide the service. But I'm thinking probably it will. You will get worlds sitting behind firewalls. Because these confidentiality problems I, I, I mentioned, you, know, you may get your own Chapel Hill Second Life planet, if you will. So now you start thinking of, while well, there's one planet today, for the most part, that, that you can go to. You, you have a choice of just going to one. There's a teen one, but that's different. Now we will think of traveling between planets. Okay. And we will think of currency transfers. And we'll think about moving inventory between them. And we'll get variations. And it sounds an awful lot like we need standards. Okay. And we need quality of service and all the same stuff. And so, in parallel to Firefox and Apache, you will get your virtual world client in your virtual world servers. And because the servers will be software as a service, some will be implemented in open source, but sometimes you'll use proprietary products as well, because maybe you want a really industrial strength database, okay, instead of a couple of MySQLs running and things like this. Consider the combinations, and other people will do this. So there are lots, once we have this, these multiple world situations and people doing different things, imagine the connections and what's required. It's really kind of fascinating to imagine what this means. Maybe as you pass between worlds, you change the look of your avatar. How do you record that? Yeah, have fun with it. So um, they are shifting to more open protocols. Money comes from providing the service in lots of different ways. Linden itself. Um, while still being the masters, if you will, of this, they're still the smartest people on the block writing the code. 
There's no question about this. Um, and they need to continue to be good stewards of, of the code. Um, and so do the parallel with the web. And as I said, it's overhyped, no question about that. But people are buying into it. And they'll be kind of the, oh, gosh, it didn't do anything for some people. But other people will come up and say, it was perfect for this. Because what people are trying to replicate is what they did somewhere else in a new environment. And that almost always fails, at least partially. We have to figure out how to do this new stuff. So expect up, down, up, down. And we'll see if it continues mostly up or, or whatever. And there'll be other players. OK. Um, so a couple, mo couple more here, and I'll, I'll finish here. Um, Expect that these protocols and formats that connect applications um, open. Okay, people are not going to want to play if they're proprietary. Those days are dead. Okay, you will see a few more, um, you know, sputtering types of things with that. You'll see a few more plays, but some people just have not gotten the message yet. Um, now, when people do software design, there are lots of different ways of, of modeling it. There's object-oriented modeling, and you can separate things by functionality and, and where they'll be located and services. Basically, lots of ways of slicing up a big programming problem into smaller pieces in actual implementation. I think people will also start thinking about saying, this is the bit of my software which will be proprietary, but this is what will be open. Okay, this is how I will design it. This is what's open to the world, either protocols, APIs, or code itself, versus this is what I'm keeping here. It will be a new aspect of how you design these things. Um, I think certain categories are absolutely going to go away, okay, in terms of being viable commercial categories. Um, you know, I've said this before. Um, I think this whole office suite idea, and yes, you all know who it's dominated by, but you also know about open office and Google Apps and, and lots of things. I can't see 10 years from now people spending hundreds of dollars, right? For some, no, some people will. Some people will. But will there be enough people doing it to finance the continued development of these as commercial products, right? That will be the issue. Because it costs a lot of money to generate these types of commercial products. And maybe what people will find, you know, it's enough. You know, the Federal um, Aviation uh, Agency. Right? FAA. You know who they are? What are they? Administration. Administration. Thank you. Um, I think it was last week said that they're considering Google Apps and Linux. Okay? Now, this might have been a negotiating ploy. This happens in open source a lot. Okay? Um, but they said it really loudly. Okay? Um, and there, there, there tends to be a theme here. And um, we haven't talked too much about intellectual property and patents. Um, such as are they good, are they bad, or whatever. Um, let me just make the assumption of that saying if you're thinking of getting a patent, and lots of people get patents, and um, biotech and lots of things, and of course there are people who think software patents are terrible, horrible things and no one should ever get them. But let me just m say this. If you were to get a patent, there are some areas you probably shouldn't bother. Okay? Or if you do get a patent, you shouldn't expect to make a lot of money from it. The closer you are to the web and the internet, the less likely you are going to be able to profit from a patent. All right? Now, you're having a patent and thinking of yourself as, as one of the good guys, all right? saying, I have this, and so therefore I'm letting other people use it, just as maybe we did with the patent pledge and some other things, and other people have done with the Linux kernel and, and so forth. That is, it gives you freedom of action of letting other people continue to use open technologies. Maybe an advantage because the patent system is not going away tomorrow. So if we're transitioning to something else, right, you have to understand. So all I'm saying is you can't have these very simplistic patent everything under the sun, license everything you can, fight to the death. That doesn't work in increasing parts of the software business today. Okay. Um, so and you should know that. Okay. So finally. Um, what has happened now, just as Massachusetts talked about sovereignty in 2005, is we've now flipped over to customers making demands about their information and control of their information. They want multiple applications. They like this idea of increased competition. They like the idea of better products at a lower price. They're getting trained. Okay? 
And to the degree that open source and open standards can deliver this, this is a fine thing. And IBM, like anybody else, has to respond. So if we don't have the products that have the right characteristics in these ways, customers won't buy them. They'll go elsewhere. So we have to adapt in different ways. Sometimes faster than we may like, but we do. But there are other times we are pushing some parts of the industry to move faster than they would like. It's, it's, it's a lot of work. So these are kind of a range of things where one might consider having choice and control if you are a customer, um, such as who provides your software, what are your financial options, what's the mix, things like this. Um, factors for managing risk, understanding what the risk is, and thinking of this you know, very important future. Right? You're putting in place systems now that will be running for several years. Um, and one of the aspects of open source, which is a little different, if, if you come to me and I sell you some proprietary software, license some proprietary software, we're probably going to have some sort of multi-year agreement, and you're paying for it. And you're probably not going to want to stop doing that for a while. You know, I paid for it, right? And with open source, you can play, right? And again, it kind of changes your negotiating position, right? Um, and I'm just saying this out loud because it's what happens in negotiations every single day. I'm not saying you shouldn't buy IBM software. Please do. I'll come back if you do. Okay. Um, but, but it's a mix, and it's changed fundamentally the way people can, can deal with these in combination. Um, it's why, even though we have WebSphere application server, proprietary software, yes, with open source in a bit, market-leading category, we bought a company called GlueCode, right, which dealt with the Geronimo open source Java web application server for a variety of reasons. But part of the reason was we were not serving the range of the market that we wanted to serve to do this. Okay? So then just finally, you know, it's the obvious thing we want to do, what makes our customers happy. But at close to 350,000 people, we've got a really big infrastructure to run ourselves to just keep it running um, every day. And so we have got to examine how open source will help us better at operations. And we do that in different ways. So a lot of this translates very practically to our bottom line right, of how we do these things. OK, so questions? Or? Be kind of quiet. So. Oh, Europe. Was that, was that a setup? <laughs> OK. Yeah, um, a, a lot of the open source um, implementers are, are European, you know, typically. In fact, it's, it, it's an issue there with some people who have said, why are we providing all the manpower to write all the open source software? And it's the U.S. and U.S. corporations that are somehow profiting. Now, you know, we're talking tens of thousands of developers, so it's, you know, I don't know the exact numbers, but Europe is doing extremely, extremely well um, that way. Development or implementation? Actual developers, <laughs> yeah. Actual developers, so um, I mean, you know, Linus Torvalds, I'm just you know, classic example and things like that. Um, Eclipse, I think, is mostly U.S. Yeah, if I had to count the developers in Eclipse, I don't know if there are any IBM folks here, but um, I have a feeling Eclipse is probably a little bit more U.S. based. So, um, but Europe is extremely strong. Mm -hmm. You can't do it by last name because America is too crazy for that. Right. But we also hadn't seen India online at that point in any meaningful way. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you knew if, uh, if there was a study out on that, European, the European Commission was working on one, and I don't think it was really Yeah, I don't know. I don't think I saw. Um, I, I, I knew the guy in the agency who was made some of these inflammatory comments. Um, no, but, but he, he didn't actually mean to say that. He was misinterpreted, um, as, as they say. Uh, yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, SUSE and things like that. Um, it's, it's becoming more global. You know, sometimes language is an issue. For the most part, English is the language of open source. You know, it's not true of every single one, but it tends to be, you know, the discussion in the forums and things like that is English. So, was there another? A lot, it seems like a lot of the open source community, there's a built-in 
thing I guess that IBM would have to work against, which essentially is like with the WS installer stack. Right. This is coming from IBM, this is coming from Oracle, and so built into that and Microsoft. community is, I mean, I could probably reach out and touch people in this room that would tell you that, you know, um, you can do everything that so SOA is trying to do with just REST. REST, right. With open source is sometimes working with a community that has a built-in attitude or philosophy that doesn't want to work with the standards that mm -hmm. would be coming from IBM. Yeah, um, yeah that's fine. I, I, I mean, you know, I mean, REST versus SOAP and WSDL, I mean, it's a religious discussion for a lot of people. You know, I mean, just like the, in computer science, there are other weird religious discussions. Um, I, th I think we kind of recognize they'll both live in different ways. Um, we are coming out of, you know, a place where you know, we, we really have to think of replacement technologies, right? We really have to think of transactions, honest to goodness transactions and things like this. Um, we're thinking of ways that model business processes. I mean, the, the value of SOA, well, let me phrase it this way. You know, people have talked about business processes for years and years and years, right? And they draw these nice little diagrams, right? And then, you know, over here there's implementation, and as the cartoon goes, you know, and then a miracle occurs, right? <laughs> and it was anything but. It was just sort of some systems that kind of did something. And so the value with SOA, before it kind of became a buzzword, was that with services, you could somehow map them more directly to business processes, right? And you could map them a little bit more directly towards saying, well, in this process is fundamentally a multi-part transaction between different parties, and we have different security considerations. And so therefore, having standards that mapped a little bit more clearly to those in traditional transactional um, representations and architectures was more attractive to us as say, than saying, let's everywhere do rest for whatever, and we'll hack up everything else. Um, so I think the way it's kind of settled out is um, REST is certainly used in lots of places. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but they're usually not very heavy weight. It's like a large number of transactions and things like this, but relatively simple, right? So it's always the thing of saying, look, you've got too many tools in the toolbox. We don't need it there, so we're using this other thing. So I think they'll both coexist. They don't have to fight each other. I don't think we're fighting it per se. Um, People will use whatever. You know, we're, um, you know, it's almost like the Java versus the PHP type of, you know, we're, we're very much into Java as well. There's no question about that, you know, big products. Um, but you know, you don't have to use Java to solve every problem in the world. Right? And so whether it's PHP or some other technologies as well. So sometimes we have to learn lessons about, about this as well. Ten years ago, Java was totally cool and juggling coffee beans and things like this, right? And things like that. And, and so it's, it's this kind of shaking out of the different technologies. Now, what you've also seen, there's another effect that's going on, is some of the people who started these technologies and the standards are in different places, organizational places, sometimes within the same groups and companies, and sometimes very different places. And so they're now contributing it from different directions. So there's an open source um, SOA platform, I guess you'd call it, um, out of Sri Lanka, and folks, several key IBM people are in that. They're not using Java. Okay, but that's okay. We keep approaching it, right? There's no pure one path here as well. So, you know, and as to IBM and what people think about us, um, you know, we've got to prove ourselves every day. You know, we, um, there's, there's a story that somebody told me that, you know, when Linux first started, we got involved with the community and we came in with some code and said, here's some code, put it in Linux. And they said, no. <laughs> and we said, but we're IBM. And they said, you know, double no, you know, <laughs> for attitude. <laughs> you know, and we had to learn to work with the community. But we, we, whether we like it or not, we're a gorilla. You know, we can be a little overpowering at times, um, but we, we try to respond as best we can. And we screw up, but we try to fix it. I mean, yeah. Things like that. Very quick, and I first a comment, I guess I'm pleased to hear your uh, prediction of the open sourcing of office apps down the road. But in, in my business, I've, I've seen a lot of big companies, multi billion dollar companies running big chunks of their business on Excel and Microsoft right. Access. 
Yeah. Because it's what you said, the de facto standard. So they've got it. You don't have to go to IT and plug the socket and get something done. What's it going to take to kind of get the critical mass to get away from it? I, I, I think Excel is the real killer app among them because of the programming ability of it. And that, that's, that's the answer. It's the macros. And it's, it's you know, the fidelity of using those macros somewhere else. It's not just what's in the spreadsheet. It's the programming. Whereas documents, for the most part, it's the words, it's the, um, the styles. Right? There's some macros, but not, not too much and things like that. That's much easier to replace, as well as the presentation. That's relatively easy. Um, so I think what, so first of all, it's not going away. Right? People will, will still do this. Um, but other things will start to sneak in, right? So there are some places which are extraordinarily strict about what software runs on people's machines. And there are places that say they're extraordinarily strict, but maybe aren't. And then there are people who have much more of a laissez-faire attitude about what people run. And they, they try to be careful because of the number of licenses and piracy and things like this. But in any case, it's these other places, um, or sometimes... Um, with uh, what they do at home, how they bet with their own money, as I think I said, um, that you get these other things sneaking in. You know, that's how Linux snuck in. No one asked, should I run Linux, right? But I would also argue that's how Windows snuck in, you know, way back when. It's how it snuck into IBM Research, where I was working, because I wanted something that had better fonts and graphics than what, at that time, Unix could provide me. And so I started, you know, I was using Windows at home, I was using it at work. Yeah, and it snuck in. So there are certain technologies that I think are stealth technologies. And um, with documents, it's a network effect. And that's always the big, the big thing. So Microsoft has an extraordinary network effect around um, .doc files in particular. Uh, they're distributed, .doc and then PowerPoint, then Excel, I would say, in that order, or, or how it are distributed. Um, you, you have a lot of PDF that, that's distributed. Um, there are a lot of .doc files that should be PDF that are sent. Mm -hmm. if, if, you're not ex if, if you're not supposed to change it, why am I sending you a word processor file? Right? Now, I'm not sending you my typewriter and paper. I'm, right? I'm giving you the printed result. Um, as the network effect grows around open document format, as it becomes more, then it will increase. Now, Microsoft, interestingly enough, is fighting the network effect of their own formats with their new XML format, this OOXML, Open Office XML. Office open, Office open XML, um, because they are trying to introduce this, this massive, I mean, it's over 6,000 pages, the spec, new format into the market. And people can't share them th that well, you know, because they're slow um, in actually providing Macintosh support for these things. So um, that's why this whole timing with ODF and OOXML, if people shift to an XML format, which one are they going to choose? is the issue if they are switching. I think what's going to, in fact, happen is you're going to see continued use of the Microsoft binary formats, the, you know, the dot doc, PPT, things like this. You're going to see increased use of the open document format. And I wouldn't be surprised, because we know they'll still exist, but the Microsoft XML formats will end up being third among use. And at that point, we'll see what the dynamics are. Most open source or other commercial software can handle the Microsoft binary formats but you hand me a 6,000-page document. You know, this is an argument I make um, saying you know, it's 6,000 pages to implement the entire thing, and we're not certain that's all you need. Okay, So how many independent implementations will there be? And I maintain there'll be one. There'll be partial implementations, but partial doesn't do me anything. If you, have, if, if you could put anything from those 6,000 pages in the document, and you send it to me, and I'm working with a piece of software that's a partial implementation, it's going to gag on the extra stuff, or not show it, or you know, put a big flashing red box or something like this. Now, what some might hope is that it says, well, that, well, gee, I should go buy a copy of such and such a software so I can read this. I think some people are going to say, the heck with this. <laughs> right? And so that's, that's why we're at this weird juncture. That's the fight. That's the controversy. It's a very important time period. Um, so combined with all these other aspects of openness and things, there are real market forces um, at play here. Um, so, but yeah, you, you, you kind of hit it. It's the Excel macro thing, which and will get solved. It will get solved. So.
Okay. In, in what way are you concerned about web services? Um, Okay. So, um, so out on the internet and things like that? Yeah, and say um, that it seems like the internet is really just a I think I think a common example people give is maybe with um, health information. Right. If health information is stored someplace and um, who has control of it, who has access to it, mm -hmm. it might change, things might happen. Okay. It seems like there's there's some tension there, but it seems that perhaps outside of health information and financial yeah so 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 there, so there are a couple of things there so one is a problem today it's not necessarily a future problem um, because while it may not all be aggregated together in one place a lot of this information exists in fragments um, certainly financial information um, I, I was in uh, so this is not even computer oriented but we were in Texas um, a few weeks ago they, they said that all the county clerks weren't working that day. That the statement had come down that they had to change the process. They routinely would put people's social security numbers on forms, public forms. And the attorney general said, you can't do that. They said, but we have to do it, but you can't do it. And so they said, we're staying home. <laughs> so it was this, this crisis of, of what information. So it's the same sort of thing that's just paper, right? That, that is a continued issue with this. It's, it's with credit card information. We still hear the issues about people losing laptops or disks on their way to storage somehow or lost and then found again. So therefore, I would say it's not web services you know, as, a, as a new problem. There are certain basic security and privacy issues that, that have to be solved um, through policy, through uh, legal issues. If you lose it, you got a problem. You've got, got an actual legal, legal issue there. Um, so um, I think um, I, th I think people need need to. I mean, you got to be careful, right? <laughs> I mean, it's a silly, silly sort of thing to say, um, but it, it's all about trust. I mean, security and privacy ultimately come down to trust. Who do you trust? What are the credentials and things like that? Now, in terms of the transactional aspects, I, I thought you were probably going to talk more about uh, things as they were on the wire. So. Uh, the web services standards are, security standards are at a much higher level of granularity than, let me say, the straight web standards about security. So what happens is if you do a web page, an encrypted web page, it hits the first point on the other side and it's decrypted. Right? It doesn't keep passing around. It's just wide open. So built into the web services security standards is a much finer level saying you can lock this field, you can encrypt this field, only certain people can do this, or this group of people. That is, you have notions of policies, honest to goodness policies. And I think that you know, notion of intelligent definition and implementation of policies and you know, enforcement of the implementation of policies is the only thing that's going to save you, per, per se. Um, someone told me, a security person told me that um, there's nothing per se ever wrong with a security model, right, as we see this, except if, well, let me phrase it this way. Um, when dealing with security, okay, there, there are three types of problems. One, the security model is, is wrong or incomplete, so that is, they didn't look at all the angles. Second is, whoever is looking at it doesn't understand it, right, that there, there's somehow just confusion, and then third, there's just straight-out coding errors, all right? Uh, so in the same way, you have to make sure that you are comfortable with the security scheme being used and that you have trust in the provider you know, along, down the line of who that security scheme is. Uh, and the policy has to state, this is my information, you may hold it, but you can't just give this to your business partners and things like that. So it's partitioning certain parts of the data with policy, auditability, and so forth. So I think that's the best we can do. I mean, I don't know how to solve it any other way other than not putting it out there. You know, um, I mean, there's so many problems with, um, with healthcare caused by incomplete healthcare information. 
it is so annoying. You know, you go to a new doctor and they hand you the form. And I really don't remember whether I was seven or eight when I had a rubella shot. Or if I had one. For years, I wasn't sure I had one. I'm still not sure, frankly. You know, and things like this. So we've got to get to a point of making healthcare somewhat more efficient by having better records. Right? Um, but yeah, it has to be done. But right now, it's a morass. It's just, you know. Um, Thank you.